All right. Good evening, listeners. You're listening to the Lament of Hope blog and podcast. I'm really excited today. I'm speaking to Simone Porter. I actually came across her music a short time ago, and she's a violinist who's performed with several different um, prominent orchestras, among them being the Philadelphia Orchestra, Los Angeles Philharmonic, as well as the New York Philharmonic, um, and several others. And it's interesting because she just she has a play a way of playing that's very youthful. Um, she plays a lot of classical music, but also it's extremely expressive. And it's funny because she, on her YouTube channel, you describe yourself as a human exclamation point, which I think is interesting because when you're playing the violin, it does seem like that. Um, very vibrant and full of energy, no matter what it is. Um, but Simone Thib, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. So I kind of want to start out for people who may not know you um, and what you do. What gave you a love for the violin and specifically for the more classical genre to play? Yeah, so uh, I don't come from a musical background actually um, at all. My parents uh, really had no, uh, very limited exposure to classical music, but they had an opera CD in their collection when I was growing up that I just became infatuated with when I was about two or three years old. And I, I think it was something, you know, it was like a compilation of greatest arias, something like that. And apparently I was just in love with this CD. I started taking it out. I would play it all the time. Um, I would quote it. And my parents uh, noticed my interest basically and hmm. very very uh, luckily for me decided to cultivate it by taking me to things like instrument petting zoos and you know family concerts and things at one of which I definitely encountered a violin whether it was through touch or through hearing or what and basically just nagged them until uh, they got me lessons and got me started on like a little 16th size violin um which I'm sure they immediately regretted because there's no way it was anything but scratchy and screechy. But uh, it, uh, I got started, um, really liked it, and sort of through a combination of happenstance and just really incredible support from people around me, it sort of trend, it sort of transformed um, very organically from a hobby into a passion, and then ultimately, you know, a career. Now. Did you start then before, were you a teenager at the time or did you start when you were like really little? No, I started playing when I was three and then, um, okay. and then I moved to Seattle uh, right before I turned six and there I ended up with the teacher, Margaret Presley, who sort of unbeknownst to me at the time, uh, prepared her students for a more, I guess, uh, a, a more serious trajectory. Most of her okay. students went on to study violin through college and eventually had careers or just, you know, went through college and it was really under her guidance that it transformed um, into something I was uh, really, I had a lot of uh, feelings for, something that I prioritized in my life. Um, and then she introduced me to Robert Lipset, who was a teacher in Los Angeles. Um, when I was 12, for a couple of years, I was flying between Seattle and LA for lessons. And then I moved there. Uh, I moved into the dorms there right before hmm. I turned uh, 15. And uh stayed at the Colburn School in LA for a number of years and that's sort of where a lot of the ingredients of career uh, got started. Now, did you find it discouraging at all? Because I know when you start the violin it can be really hard because it takes a while before it actually sounds nice. Did you find it discouraging? I mean or? at that time honestly I don't really remember because I was three but I think at that time it was you know a fun activity I'm sure. Um, if anything I think the the just the the uh, frustration definitely came later when you know what it could sound like or would sound like um i think almost the more the more you improve the more that you're exposed to or you have an idea of what you want um and what you are or could be capable of i think the frustration honestly grows later <laughs> what do you find hardest now about being a violinist i mean i think connecting your vision and your musical ideas which exist in this hmm. sort of abstract plane with the physical reality honestly I mean playing the violin is physically kind of it's really awkward it's a uh, you know the sort of precision um that's required the strength the coordination is still 
hard. Um, and working on that, the sort of amount of barriers and building that you have to do before you even get to start executing your ideas um, can be very frustrating. I mean, it's every day. Um, but, you know, parts of that also become fun and interesting as well, even though uh, some of the challenges of playing violin are not creative in the sense that they're not uh, so much about coloring or shaping or phrasing. Um, they require creative approaches. So the strategies mm -hmm. of practice can be rewarding and enjoyable. What do you mean exactly by, is it the way you have your body placed that actually affects how you're playing? Or how do you change it based on the song you're doing? Um, Essentially just, it's like micro everything. So, you know, like on the violin, it's so sensitive. If you misplay, your finger has to go in the same millimeter. You're right. training it to go in the same millimeter all the time. You A shaky bow, you're trying to basically organize your body in this like pretty awkward way like your arms twisted around you're you're drawing your bow there's so many little muscles that have to be working together sometimes have to be doing off uh, opposite things um and it's it just feels like a crazy way to spend time that i'm like training my pinky finger so that i can you know uh emulate or invoke a certain emotion <laughs> and mm. it's uh it's uh it just exists on different planes. So I think, you know, the frustration comes when you and I have an idea of what something could be. You have it in your head. Trying to get that out into the world um, mm. is tricky. <laughs> is there a song in particular that you think came out like you wanted it to? There have been certain performances and pieces that I have been proud of the work I've done on. I mean, some of the my favorite things to perform are um, contemporary classical works, you know, living composers who uh, experiment with sound worlds and genre yeah. and uh, narrative and trajectory in a way that's uh, really, really exciting to me. Um, playing some of that music, which has less guideposts than say, you know, some of the mm. classics that were written, you know, a hundred or plus years ago um, is really just stimulating you know we grow up there are sort of the classics like there is in you know any other any art form any literature anything there are certain yeah. things that everyone learns and plays as a student and as a professional um and those are you know phenomenal phenomenal works that have stood the test of time and are just great but through osmosis you sort of absorb a philosophy of how to approach them before you've ha had a chance to really figure out what you want so mm. Uh, playing those pieces as a professional a lot of times is almost unlearning is sort of trying to develop a relationship with the music with the score um that's personal um and erasing almost just everything that you've heard and that might lead to you making sort of automatic artistic decisions um mm. so playing works that don't have that history that don't have you know dozens of recordings that yeah. uh where you really have to craft your own understanding and are required to ask of every single note, every single phrase, you know, what does this want from me? What can I give to it? Uh, that freshness is very exciting to me and has taught me a way, uh, an approach that I do, I try to take with me to uh, back to the other things, to the classics, to the you know, well-known repertoire. Do you feel a lot of pressure when you're trying to create something and um, wanting to articulate it in a way that is compelling for your audience and for yourself? Like, do you find that pressure overbearing at times or just just completely exciting um oh no no I feel I feel like pressure is overbearing all the time <laughs> all the time for sure um it's both it's extremely exciting um it's something I'm incredibly grateful for but uh the pressure has is pretty constant I mean playing the violin in front of people is yeah I find it very scary <laughs> um and there have been times certainly in my life where the pressure has been overwhelming and I've had to develop ways to contend with it um and it's still it's kind of a constant but uh it's just familiar now and I focus on okay the joy of it as much as possible well how do you balance it because I know at least I mean I don't you know for the musicians I know you know they're starting out it's not like oh wow they have all these you know really huge opportunities that you've gotten to have so far but for them, I mean, it's even hard just to balance life, like time with friends, time to relax, time to rest with 
music because for the musicians I know, you know, it's all consuming. They love music. And so it's mm -hmm. in every aspect of their life. And sometimes when I've talked to them, they're like, you know, I, I wish I didn't, I could um, learn how to balance better my art with people and with life. Um, how do you do that? Do, have you found a balance or is that something you're still working on? It's definitely a work in progress. I mean, I found a way to do it just because it is, it's been my life for so long, okay. but I'm also definitely given to monomania in all things. I think I work in extremes a lot. A lot of times I am just delving. All I'm doing is working, practicing, thinking about the music, listening to it, recording myself. I, I get obsessive, um, which has been very, very useful. Um, and I also don't mind taking a good amount of time away from the violin um hmm. but i i definitely work in extremes a little bit in a way that i would like to curb um it's i mean the thing that i always remember is like it is it's a job it, it really really is it, it's something that i'm passionate about and it's something that doesn't have hours and it's difficult in that the majority of my time with it is totally self-dictated. Like when I go to a concert and I play shows, of course, uh, usually I'm traveling and on the road. And when I am in this location, then yeah. you just schedule, you know, you go to rehearsal, you have, uh, you know, a publicity, something, you play the concerts. Um, but most of the time, like many of my days, it's just, it's me deciding when and how to practice. Um, so the discipline part is difficult, but it is, you know, it's, it's a job you get your you I have to put it down a little bit at the end of the day you pick it up in the thing it's uh something I love um it's not the only thing I love um and ultimately there is a pragmatic element to it as well which is you have to be prepared to go on stage and you have to be prepared to go on stage because that's how I make my living so thinking about it both as you know a love of my life and just it's a job has been I think beneficial how have you gotten to the point where you can make money from it because I know it, it's hard especially I think for even just a classical genre but also I mean you have to be very good because you're competing with a lot of different people um how for you like how did you get to the point where it's like okay now I can make money from this so I can do what I love and support myself at the same time um, I was very, very lucky that my professional activities in music started when I was very young, when I was still in school. So I went to okay. a conservatory in LA that was um, a full ride. Everyone who, it was a tiny school, it's like 120 people, but everyone who got in uh, to the school, Colburn, uh, was given free tuition room and board, which okay. you know was obviously incredible, um, uh, kind of as it should be, but, it, you know, as... It was a phenomenal place to be and to build yourself up both as a musician and, as, you know, a professional. But I started working, I was working quite a bit when I was still in school. So by the time I got out, I already had, um, okay, I, I had professional management and enough concerts, et cetera, that I knew I could support myself. Did you find it hard to find a management or did the management kind of find you? It was years long process basically um so Colburn had something sort of in-house management called Colburn Artists and there's a woman Laura Leithens who um basically introduced those of us who were sort of pursuing solo careers um okay to management training almost she was our manager but didn't take a commission and there was sort of equal emphasis on the business side and the education side um and that was sort of the stepping stone and through my work with her, I was introduced to um, my current management company, Opus 3, mm -hmm. and started working with them, and they're, you know, full-time uh, business. So I was sort of exposed to um, the workings of the industry, I guess, while still in school. And it was still very much an adjustment to um, do it, you know, in the big leagues. Uh, but I'm really, yeah. really, that that opportunity to get a glimpse of what it was going to be was really, really invaluable. Did you feel like your childhood was different in any way because you were, you had this passion and also this career almost trajectory that you knew kind of early on 
did you find it different difficult to connect with you know kids your age who I mean you know most kids aren't learning the violin at such a an intense level did you find that difficult at all um you know it was definitely there were definitely a lot of things that I missed but I don't love thinking about it that way because for all the sacrifices there were just infinite opportunities gained so yes I missed a lot of school I ended up um dropping out of so I sort of dropped out and skipped around some grades and then ended up just dropping out but I uh I loved school I loved academics my parents are both professors of international studies and I really liked my school and my friends and to this day I really really value friendships with people who are not in you know the incredibly insulated music world um so yes it was definitely different and there was a level of intensity and future thinking um from a very young age um at that point I that I think I only I, I think it's only later in life with perspective that I understand just how that like really grasp the intensity of it. Um, hmm. But I wouldn't have done anything, anything differently. I'm really glad that uh, that work was done then. And I'm also really glad that uh, I kind of was always exposed to other things and other people coming from a non-musical family was I really do consider a blessing because my parents, you know, stressed things like academic excellence and intellectual curiosity. Like that was what they were stage yeah. parents about in some ways. Um, and that's been such a gift. How did it feel for them? Like, was that an adjustment when you decided, okay, I'm going to pursue music full time and, and not even, I don't want to say not pursue academics because per music in its own way is an academic study, but um, kind of stepping away from the traditional sense of school how did that go for parents? Was that like a pretty smooth transition or? I mean, again, it had been happening for a while. So at that point, the, when I left, it was because I had been traveling between Seattle and LA every week. So I was missing one or two days of school a week for like three okay. years, which was not really great for anybody. Um, and it was possible. And I had people around me who were facilitating it in like really phenomenal ways. But at that point, it just sort of became clear that that it was so fragmented um, that yeah. I kind of felt like I was half-assing both. Um, so uh, committing to violin and then I moved, I left home uh, when I was 15 basically and moved down to LA. I think it was definitely hard for them. They saw me leave four years before I would have in the traditional, like if I had finished high school normally. Yeah. Um, so yes, it was hard for them in a way that I, again, did not appreciate at the time. And I think that they kept from me because they recognized that that was the best thing um, for me, which it was. How did you feel 15? I mean, that's young. You're not even, how did oh, you yeah. feel like leaving home? Oh my God. I was like, fine. I mean, of course I was, I was 15. I was like, oh, I'm an adult. This is totally fine. that I'm just running around Los Angeles. And you know, it was obviously there are adjustments. I had never really done errands before um you know uh, or you know not in the sense that you have to when you're living alone um yeah and you don't have any guardian or anything uh so it was definitely big but I had the protection of the school I was in and I was definitely very solitary but it taught me a lot about independence um at the time I really don't remember feeling I didn't feel as young as I was, I think, at that moment. And of course, now I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so lucky that nothing bad happened to me. But um, I was pretty responsible. My uh, rebellious phase actually came later, which is probably a good thing. Well, when you were, um, for you being 15 and then, you know, growing in that did you how do you see a change in yourself during that four years of school did you because you were ta so, talking about being solitary but you don't seem very solitary you seem like a very energetic personality were you always like that even when you were 15 yes um but I would say I'm both like I you know I am energetic and gregarious and I love being around people but I spend the vast majority of my time alone and when I'm working you know when I'm on the road it's I'm in a different I'm in cities where I know nobody alone in hotel rooms most of the time um so it's hmm. I love socializing and everything but my life is 
by and large, like very, very um, solitary, occasionally very isolated. Um, so yes, that sort of was already true when I was 15. Um, I think I found, I've always found ways to cushion it and that I do have very close relationships. Um, and also reading has been essential to me. Um, hmm. Always, I'm, I get really lonely if I'm not in a good book, but when I am, I feel like, you know, uh, the time I'm spending alone is still time spent with the world. What book are you reading now? I'm reading YN by Esther Yi. I just uh, picked it up. It's very, it's very weird. It's like a Kafka-esque taste on, on uh, take on fan fiction and like fan culture it's it's very oh, wow. strange um i i got it as a sort of random recommendation and went in blind i actually don't even really know if i like it yet but we'll see i just started it yesterday do you have a favorite book one that you go back to a lot Ooh, i have favorites but i don't have i don't have one i really really don't there are some things that i've returned to um I've only recently been sort of dabbling in rereading, um, but no, there's no, there's no one. I guess okay. Well, then name some favorites. Um, I recently reread uh, "Mating" by Norman Rush, which I think, hmm. which I hadn't read in ten years, and uh, I was eighteen. Was like, it was so beyond me when I read it when I was eighteen. Um, but coming back to it was phenomenal. That was the that was the most recent thing that I've reread, and I absolutely mm. adored it. Um, I really like um, a lot of sci-fi things. I read mm. I read uh, Ted Chiang short stories or something. I always recommend to people um, the Three Body Problem. I um, I absolutely adore. Um, I do really love some classics like uh, Henry James Portrait of a Lady. Um, I yeah uh, I kind of try and flip flop in my life between uh I'll read like mostly modern fiction but I try to supplement it with nonfiction and classics as much as possible. Is there like a character you think you relate a lot to that you? Ooh, read? that's a good question. You know, I was actually just thinking about this. Not really. Um, there are characters that I strongly identify with when I'm reading, but there is no there are there's nobody I really have in mind I think there's are the people I tend to be very loyal to are you know I love reading about women and young women and I always find myself drawn to tenacity and curiosity in characters which is also what I'm drawn to in my friendships but those are definitely the characters that if I don't it, relate to them so much I think it's like my idealized version of myself relates to them, mm. maybe. <laughs> like, the person I want to be relates to these characters. What would you, because that, that's, that's interesting, what would you like to be? You know, 10 years from now, you're looking back and you're seeing all you've done um, and all the things you've gone through. Like, what what would you like yourself to look like as a person? Um, I'd like to be a really good friend. <laughs> I'd like to be, I'd like to lose certain elements of timidity. Um, I'd like to, I think in 10 years, I hope that I'm better at not avoiding things. I'm a better at, um, hmm. I guess, observing things straight on. Um, I I hope that I'm better at acting rather than reacting. I mean, you know, these are all like classic things that I think everybody wants. But, you know, I want to, I think growing up is being better in some ways to, the people that you love uh focusing on serving or service acts of service more than taking um figuring out what you specifically can offer um yeah. in different contexts and knowing that it is very different based on the person or the setting um but yeah i mean my my a theme of my life right now is sort of shedding timidity that leads to paralysis that's an overarching oh, thing right that's, now. That's really interesting. What? How would you give an example of that? Like, is there something? Um, I think, you know, a lot of it is getting so nervous about an opportunity 
mm. that or th thinking about yourself as totally unworthy that it gets so scary that I just don't do anything like don't mm. go for something don't reach out to a person don't um and, you know, I, I think about this, you know, violinistically and that I've tried to shed a lot of my timidity just on stage, but also in the way I think about my career. Like, what does it mean to, you know, just try, like, put yourself out there, write to the person, contact someone, um, ask somebody for what you want, um, rather than the sort of reflexive, oh, not me, oh, not me. And, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I don't want to call it imposter sy syndrome because sometimes it's real, like some things are you know, out of my purview or I don't have access to. And that's totally, totally fine. But there are also things that I think I've missed out on because that I could have had if I had just, you know, been braver. Um, so I'd like to be that. What do you think um, performance wise, because I know you've, you've performed a lot with orchestras and you are on a solo career. Or do you have a goal of wanting to like come out with your own, like doing your own tour? Like eventually something like Joshua Bell, you know, where you're like doing your own tour for people to come see you or be in a movie soundtrack, getting to be able to do like background music. What's your goal with your music? Um, well, I, I love what I'm doing now. I would just love, I think it, at a certain point to get projects based. So Hmm, I okay. think the thing that I do best is not is crafting programs that are sort of narratives like I like my recital hmm. programs you know when I get to program it when I'm actually spending a lot of time with the audience and talking to them um I like it to be sort of a journey rather than just like throwing music at them I like things that are connected conceptually almost in addition hmm. to or almost even more so than they are connected like sonically or musically um so having the freedom to do that, to program things like that is very exciting to me. I'm recording an album this year for the first time. So that's sort of, that's the culmination of, you know, years long goals. Um, so that'll be the next step. That's the thing that sort of is dominating my mind at the moment. Is there any songs you've like written yourself or is it? No, um, no, okay. it's, it's sort of, it's more like a curation. Um, okay. There are things that are connected and, uh, a program that I've just put together and I like the conversations that these pieces have with one another what's the theme if you can say I'm gonna keep it a secret for now oh, you're gonna keep a secret okay <laughs> when can people expect to see it or hear about it probably in a year <laughs> okay it's a it's a ways out it takes a long time it takes a really imagine. long time yeah um I was going to ask you, and forgive me, I'm probably going to mispronounce it, but I saw, I was listening to a piece you did by, um, how do you say his name? It's Arvo Pert? Oh, Arvo Pert. Yeah. Yes, Pert. There yeah, yeah, you yeah. Go. You're saying yes. it right. Oh, it was beautiful. Um, Thank you. I love a great piece. Yeah, I was, but I was watching you perform it and you was just like, you, yeah, really intense and like, you're really into it. Um. Like, what are you thinking of for that piece even? Like, what is the, do you give yourself a narrative when you're playing? So like, it's not even about you anymore performing. It's more of, okay, I'm telling a story and how can I do this to the best of my ability? Like, how do you, how do you experience the music as you're performing it? Well, you know, I think a lot of it, a lot of the practicing you do is thinking about things so deeply and picking them apart so much that they become instinct um mm. which is part of the which is a hard part like getting so deep in something and just really considering it to such an extent that you will just that you don't have to think about it and that's the sort of paradoxical challenge honestly but yeah. every single piece requires a different approach and requires I think that level of consideration and it gets easier in that you learn you know certain lexicons or styles and then you have sort of a you can jump ahead a little bit when you you know have a new piece of repertoire just because you recognize what it's trying to say and you are sort of fluent in the language um but on stage I used to think sort of literally in terms of narrative and storytelling and I would think about you know characters and words and I would really verbalize to myself um like a story now it's less pro programmatic um I recognize I ask myself 
what it, the sort of emotional journey of a piece is, but mm. I don't need it to be like a specific scene. It's more, I, I like it to exist in the abstract just because that's where, you know, that's one of the huge strengths of music. Um, I like finding sort of verbal precision sometimes, but on stage, it's like, it's really just an attention that um, feels really really special and even mm. sacred and when it's with other people um that's great because it's shared um I've been playing a lot of solo violin music and actually my whole album is solo violin and that's different because you're not bouncing off anybody else you really have yeah. to sort of occupy the role of the sole performer and a listener um so that you do have almost a relationship and a, um something to bounce off with with yourself do you still experience like stage fright before you oh, perform? Oh yeah, totally. How do you? Because how do you control if if you're the bow? I mean, everything is, as you said, it's like super sensitive. How do you help with calming your body to allow for? Clean I mean, notes? years of practice. Basically, mm. I mean, I practice things very attentively knowing what nerves feel like so that they're solid yeah, okay. um I do things like long hole bows every single day so that I have I don't have shakes um and it's also just a mentality like I I know what it means to go on stage nervous now and just do it just plow through at like you know sometimes nerves are good and they just they, they're just like sort of this burst of energy and you feel really attentive and energized and then occasionally you'll have a performance where you feel like you are holding on by your pinky the entire time and you just have to figure out how to get yourself out or how to get yourself through um and those aren't ideal but I recognize what it takes I guess I mean performing as much as possible is the best possible thing you can do like as a student as a professional now I do run throughs for people before I go on stage if it's something new to me um there is being on stage and playing for people is just totally different you can you once you've done it enough you can mimic it in your practice but it's totally different there are things you can only learn while performing um mm. and luckily I've done it enough now that I'm still very much learning but I know how to navigate certain blocks and you know snags that come up in the moment are you happiest playing it in front of people or by yourself? I would need both. I crave both. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. There's no, I mean, one can't exist without the other. Well, what do you mean by that? That's, that's interesting. I mean, I literally can't go out on stage without practicing hours and yeah, hours and hours on my own. Yeah. So there's that. But um, even beyond that, just like, on stage is I was gonna say the result but it's really a continuation of experiments that you've conducted on your hmm. own um the so it doesn't feel like a goal necessarily to you oh it's definitely a goal but okay. when I'm but when I'm on stage I really try hard not to make a performance a reconstruction of like a practice session or a previous rehearsal or something like that okay. it only works for me and the way I get out of nerves is when I feel like I am actively crafting it in the moment hmm. um oh, wow. if I feel like it's just sort of something I'm plopping in that I get very tense it's like oh well that went better. yeah that went better yesterday it moved in this way eh, no absolutely not like that's a pathway to fear and destruction but if I Again, like I recognize that I have trained my instincts for this repertoire mm. in a good way. And I trust myself on stage to explore things, to follow little inspirations, to be flexible and open and porous to however, how, what someone else is doing or how it yeah. just feels in this specific space. That's Those are the performances that feel the best, often sound the best, and are the most rewarding. It's interesting because you were talking about timidity, but it seems like with your music, you're not. I would actually say the opposite. Honestly, I think I'm much really? better at being, um, I'm much better at being bold in my social life and uh, just other life than I am. I think I've always been more timid when it comes to violin and that's something I've tried to uh, stop. I mean, I've tried to let boldness from the rest of my life bleed into my violin as much as possible but I think I compartmentalized um for a really long time um 
because violin was something that it's, mm. I always had my deepest insecurities about um, that I compartmentalized in a way that I think was beneficial and then stopped being helpful. Um, but I have more care in music and more ego in it um, than mm. pretty much anything yeah. else and figuring out how to like acknowledge that get the ego out of it and um rec respect it while still sort of taking risks with it um yeah is probably a lifelong education honestly what do you what's the harshest thing someone has said to you about your playing that like really imprinted itself because i know for me even doing writing or for me my passion interviewing I mean, I've had people say some harsh things sometimes, and it really is painful because you're like, you don't see the effort I'm trying to put into this and the time. Um, what do you think? Like, do you remember something, a word that was said to you is very, that you just, that kind of just hmm. stayed in your mind? I think when people have told me that, I mean, I think in school and for a long time I was really concerned with the violinistic elements like accuracy and just the technique of it because it's so hard um yeah. and I knew that that wasn't my strength in the way that some people were just you know flawless um and yeah. that used to be the thing that I was the most insecure about and then it switched and now the thing that is most disappointing to me is when I get a comment like people were unmoved like oh it was it was it was nice it was perfect it was like it was very accurate or something now that would be uh, my um yeah. nightmare honestly um yeah things like that I mean I know when I do well and I know when I don't do well for sure like developing a trustworthy relationship with yourself uh is in your own ears is definitely essential but uh yeah, the thing that definitely hurts me the most is when it's just meh. I'd rather I it I wouldn't actually rather tank, but uh I think being sort of like eh is in some ways worse than it is definitely worse than like really trying and going for something and it's not work and it doesn't work out. What about the most encouraging thing? Has someone said something to you that you were like, "Oh, this is just the best that I've ever had?" Yeah. When, you know, working with composers, when they like what you're doing with their ideas, one of the most yeah, validating things that's, that's cool. ever happened. Um, and yeah, whenever someone, whenever someone emphasizes creativity or like, oh, I never heard it that way before. Oh, I can hear the thought of this. Um, oh my gosh. I, like when, uh, when people feel like there's a clear, like, journey like they're really engaged um mm. that's really exciting to me and obviously there are people whose opinions I value um so much I have certain friends who I play for and when they're and they've heard me play you know a bazillion times so when they're really impressed I'm like okay yeah yeah that feels good because you've seen me do all sorts of things and for this to be sort of ex an exceptional thing I'm like yes well someone I want to ask you one more question I'm curious um do you have a piece of music that you think describes you, like your your inmost yourself? So when you play it, you just connect with it so much. You're like, this is. If I could be a melody, like I think I'd choose this song. Ooh, oh my gosh, I couldn't possibly choose. But two things I've been playing recently that I adore, um, and that I feel great and natural expressing is um Andrew Norman Sabina which is one of the things yes. I'm recording, which is... I listened to that. It's, I've got to be honest. It was a little different. I had I the beginning threw me. Yeah, I know. I, that's what I love about it. Um, It's definitely, it blooms in such a beautiful, in a yeah. way that I just like really, really, really love. Um, And I love, that's a piece where I really feel like I'm a listener. Um, It's all about sort of bringing out resonances of the violin. And when I play that, I feel like I'm listening to my instrument and to a space in a way that I really mm. appreciate. Um, and I've also been playing Strauss Sonata a lot, which I adore. Mm. It's my favorite violin sonata. I think this, it, 
I, I, it's so virtuosic. It's so passionate. Um, Strauss wrote it right when he had met the woman that he was, uh, later to marry and you can hear just this flush of first love and everything and the second I've been just obsessed with the second movement lately because it just wow it's so tender it is truly it really captures for me what wow. it feels like to be in love and like in excited that you are in love wow well Simone uh, you know thank you again and again for listeners I'm gonna have a you know, link to her website, but I do highly encourage you to listen to some of her music. There's not enough on there. So I'm glad you're coming off an album because there's not enough, I think, to I agree. I know. <laughs> um, but there is stuff out there to look at. Um, And it's just, it's absolutely beautiful. But Simone, thank you so much for your time. This was fascinating. Thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome.